Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible and find the book of Romans. And as you're finding your place, let me say thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight we've set aside time uh, to reflect deeply on what Christ has done for us. Uh, and so tonight as we move through the evening, it's going to have really two parts. One, uh, for just a few moments, I want us to consider our need uh, deeply to contemplate the fact that we need a Savior. Uh, and so as we walk through a different passage, uh, a couple of different places tonight, my prayer is, is that that would settle deeply on each of us. And then the second part of the evening uh, is we're going to focus on the answer to that problem. Uh, and it's going to culminate in the privilege that we have to take the Lord's Supper together. And so uh, I am so thankful for the opportunity this evening uh, throughout the Christian calendar uh, as churches all over the world will gather to reflect on what Good Friday really means. And so, so, so thankful for this opportunity. So here we go with part one. A few weeks ago, I was struck by what Alistair Begg said, and I think it begins the time well before we look at Romans. Alistair wrote this. He said, some claim that man, mankind's problem is not that we're sinful, but that we're sick. If only we could provide for ourselves the right kind of care, medicine, or technology, then our lives would be transformed and we'd be okay. For surely man is essentially good, not innately sinful. At least goes the thinking. As I was thinking about this quote and thinking about Paul's vivid description of a theology of sin in the first part of his letter to the church at Rome, I was reminded that we live in a world that where the typical psychology of the day is, is that we are innately pretty good. We're okay. Uh, we're not sinful. As a matter of fact, to even use the term sin, uh, to even consider depravity and sinfulness is a word that's considered archaic today. It's outdated. Oh, surely it's ineffective, right? Uh, to think about sin, to think about that we're in rebellion against God. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that until we understand the depth of our own sinfulness, uh, in, until we understand that we're in the middle of a great dilemma, we'll never celebrate the cross rightly. And we'll never celebrate, good, uh, celebrate Easter rightly. And so as you think about this tonight, as you think about the problem, let me just remind you of a couple of things before we look at Romans chapter 2 and 3 that the root of the problem is inward. Uh, so often we think that our problems lie outside of us, don't we? Think about it for just a moment. Everyone else is to blame. Have you ever heard that? Maybe you've uttered that very same thing. It's the circumstance in which I'm in. Uh, someone else is at fault. Surely not me. It can't be that I'm the problem. Uh, surely I'm, I'm better than the next person. That's the common rhetoric of the day. That's how we've been taught. That's what we think. But the problem truly lies within, doesn't it? I was also reminded this week that to think in spiritual terms, uh, to think in biblical terms, is really the only way to begin the story, that we have to come to terms with the fact that we are broken. Another recent book that has been penned on the cross, two gentlemen say this, it's not clear what the cross has to do with the drama of my life today. The old religious vocabulary of sin has been replaced by psychological vocabulary. We may acknowledge that we're broken. Have you heard that language recently? we're broken, but to actually say that we are sinful and broken the moral law and the divine law is something that we really stay away from. We are broken not only because of some tragic situation in our constitution, we are broken because we are at revolt against God. You see, we live in a culture that likes to blame shift. We live in a culture that likes to exegete everyone else's sin, but not reflect deeply on our own. And so by and large, by and large, sadly, the consensus today is that the problem is outside of us. But the Bible paints an entirely different picture. The Bible is very clear, and with great precision, it notes and points out to us that the problem lies within the human heart. It's within us. Someone once said that within the dark citadel of our own heart is the root of our greatest dilemma. You see, Paul's theology of sin is where we have to begin. It's really the first step. And so I want us to read this. It's pretty lengthy, but find chapter 2 of the book of Romans. And I want you to put yourself in the narrative, into the letter. Almost go back centuries and think about the first group that would have heard this read aloud. And I want you to understand that this is not just some word that was given for those in antiquity, but this word of which Paul is writing is for us in this room tonight. And so listen to what Paul says as he paints this vivid picture of man's dilemma. Notice verse 1, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges 
For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. And listen to this, for God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day... When according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And then look at chapter 3. Paul continues to give a vivid picture of man's dilemma. Notice verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail on when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why do... And why not do evil that God may come, that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they've not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul goes on and on and on, unequivocally, to point out that man's problem is not external. Man's problem is internal. What you'll find if you read this carefully is that you'll find that sin is comprehensive. If we go back, this is not a verse-by-verse study tonight, but what you'll find clearly if you were to think carefully about what we've read is that Paul is very clear that sin is comprehensive. It affects every area of our life. He also points out that sin is it's sort of global. It's universal. That there is no one who is safe. That everyone is guilty. We're guilty by nature. Remember what uh, David said, that we were born into iniquity? That I am a sinner by my relationship to my first father, Adam, and so are you. But we're also guilty by volition, that we choose to sin. That because of that which is there, that we are the type of people who actually choose that which is against God. 
And so everywhere you look, everything that Paul is saying is that it's comprehensive. It is, it is global. And then you also pick up that there is a problem, that there is a judgment that is right and righteous. We picked up terms like judgment, wrath, and fury. Did you see that? Did you hear that? You could say, that, again, that the problem lies within. Our conscience confirms what the law points out, that we are in a problem. We are in a major problem. I was thinking, as I was reading through chapter 2 and chapter 3, you see the problem's in the first person, isn't it? Think with me about the whole biblical narrative. Many of you have been around the church for a long time, so you know this, but listen carefully. I am Adam in the garden, rejecting my role as a husband and protector. I'm Cain, standing over Abel, overcome with jealousy and moved to murder. I'm Israel at Sinai, disloyal to my promise, crafting my own idols. I'm David, being lazy in the palace, looking at Bathsheba from the rooftop and taking forbidden fruit. I'm Peter at the trial and the crucifixion, denying our Lord at the, his moment of need. I'm doubting Thomas with the disciples, demanding rational proof. And I'm a Pharisee, skilled in theological jargon, carrying out religious ceremonies, while inwardly preoccupied with false enchantments of power and success. Everything in me and everything in you cries guilty, guilty, guilty. You see, we're sinners by nature and by choice. I'm a sinner because I'm related to my first father, Adam. I have an inborn disposition to rebel against him. But I'm also guilty because I'm Jamie. I choose that which is selfish and sinful. You see, none of us tonight... Regardless of your track record, none of us can hide. We cannot hide. And because of sin, here's the consequences. We're banished from the presence of God. We're alienated from him. We're dead to the beauty of God, Ephesians 2. And we're helpless before the judgment of God. You see, the situation is grim, isn't it? The fact is, is the problem is not outside of us. The problem is inside of us. And so the fact is, is that something outside of us has to happen. Something outside of us actually has to happen. And unless something outside of us happens, we are in dire straits. Just a few chapters later in this book of Romans, there begins to be light. There begins to be hope that's sort of shed abroad on the scene. Because truly, if there's an internal problem, and that is our greatest, um, greatest dilemma that we cannot fix, truly there has to be something that happens outside of us to fix our greatest problem. Well, the good news tonight is that there is something that has happened in history that changes the entire landscape of all that there is of all the problem, it's fixed in Jesus. And so when you think about the gospel, when you think about the truth that Jesus Christ came and died for us, it is the only answer, it is the only solution to a deep internal problem. And so when Paul picks up Romans chapter five, which is many for many of you, even in this room, I know is a classic passage, it crescendos and it answers the problem. If you'll be reminded of what I said a few minutes ago, when you think about the dilemma of sin and the consequences, one is that we've been banished from God. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, we see that the, the problem is, is that we've been separated from him because of sinfulness. We know that. We feel that. We understand that. That's not just far removed from us. We also noted that not only are we banished from God, but because of our sin, Paul would tell the church at Ephesus that we're dead in our trespasses and sin, that apart from Christ, we don't behold the beauty of Christ. That we don't, we're not alive to the things of God. And then we talked about how we are alienated from him, how there is judgment that is to be expected, that the fury and the wrath of God will rest on those who reject Christ. Well, if that's the problem, and it's an internal problem, we have an external solution, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so think about this. The problem is in the first person. The solution is in the third person. Think about what Paul would write. In all of these dilemmas... Paul would say that there's a, there's a solution. So look at chapter 5, verse 9. One verse. We're going to pick it apart for just a second. 
Notice what Paul says about Jesus. In verse 9 of chapter 5, he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, I love this next phrase, much more shall we be saved by him. Now notice, from the wrath of God. It's the same problem and the same dilemma that he notes in chapter 2 of those who refuse him. That rejecting Christ leads to eternal sorrow. Rejecting Jesus Christ leads to eternal damnation. That there is judgment that is right and just for those who reject him. Sin has consequences eternally and temporarily. But the solution that Paul notes to the church at Rome and for us, which gives us good news, is that solution, that dilemma of wrath and judgment is absorbed in the work of Jesus. Jesus died so that we could be set free and not have to fear judgment, but walk in confidence and gladness and in joy. So if this is the answer, not only do we see that the answer is Jesus to the judgment that awaits, we also see that the answer to deadness, to being dead in our sin, is based upon the grounds of what Jesus has done for us that he can bring us to life. If you skip on down into chapter, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 17, notice what Paul says. He says, For if because of one man's trespass, referring to Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Now notice, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You see, when we're united to Jesus by faith, we are fully alive. Does that make sense? We are fully alive by our union to Jesus. Sin, the deadness that comes with that, is eradicated, and now our heartbeat is for the glory of God, for the greatness of Christ. This is the solution of the gospel. And then the thing that we also have to notice, the good news of the price that Jesus paid. Not only does he fix the problem of judgment, not only does he, on his work and his life, give us new life, but there's something else beautiful that Paul notes in chapter 5, is that even though we were banished and alienated because of our sin, we can now be reconciled to him. This is the beautiful part of what many of you have quoted, you've prayed through, you've read, you've heard preached from, But for the sake of our evening, I want you to listen in its totality what Paul says from chapter verse six through chapter, excuse me, through verse eleven. Listen to what Paul says. He says this: For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Isn't it an amazing thought to know that in Christ we go from being enemies of God to friends of God? That we have been reconciled to God through the work of Jesus Christ. You see, what we celebrate tonight and what we recognize tonight, that we have an internal problem that can only be solved by an external solution. And that solution was the death of Jesus Christ on the behalf of sinners. We rejoice in the cross of Jesus Christ because of what it has accomplished. It has accomplished for us something that you cannot accomplish on your own, something that attending a thousand plus worship services will never accomplish for you. Only Jesus Christ answers the solution. You see, the problem again is in the first person I have sinned. I am guilty. I have been jealous. I have, I have, I have. And the solution is in the third person. He did. And because he did, because Jesus died for us, we can experience God in full, that we can know that we don't have to fear him, that we don't have to walk in despair, but we can walk fully alive to the beauty of God. 
because we've been reconciled because of the work of Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing. And so tonight, how do we celebrate that? How do we celebrate that eternal gift of love that rests on us? Well, one of the things that the church does throughout its history is that we have the opportunity to partake and receive the Lord's Supper together. What a special moment. Have you ever thought about that we stand in a long line of those who have gone before us who have been redeemed by his grace, been forgiven because of his grace, and we get to celebrate in a visible demonstration of the gospel tonight. And so here in just a moment, we're going to come and receive the elements. And so we have three trays to my right and two trays to my left. And we're going to have an opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper. And so and Pastor Ryan's going to lead us through this in just a few moments. But I'm going to pray for us. After I pray, I'm going to ask that the two sides, the left and the right, if you guys will file out on the outside, on the outside of the aisle, if you'll come and get... Um, there's actually two cups, the bread's in the bottom. If you'll take that back to your seat, and if you'll wait just a few moments, and Ryan will lead us through this. After the sides go, if those of you in the middle will come, there's three trays on this side, so you'll probably find some here. And then if you'll take that back to your seat and just wait quietly for just a few moments, Ryan will lead us to receive the elements together. And so let me pray for us. Father, thank you this evening that, Lord, as we consider all that you've done for us, Lord, we're mindful that apart from Jesus Christ, we're empty, we're bankrupt. We, uh, Lord, we're so grateful this evening that you can be trusted in every season. And so, Lord, our prayer this evening is that as we consider our problem, as we consider our dilemma, I pray that we wouldn't be moved to despair, but, God, that we would be moved to glad confidence because of what you've done for us. Lord, that we would see that to be fully alive is to surrender our life to Jesus Christ. So God, thank you that you paid the debt that we could never pay. Thank you, God, that you, that you bore in your own son, Lord, wrath and judgment so that we could be set free. And so God, we, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that everything in us cries guilty, but everything in him shouts pardoned. And so, God, we pray that that would be the anthem of our life as we reflect deeply on the cross of Christ. God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.